I am retiring as coach of the Dallas Mavericks. Thank you. I'm thrilled, I'm excited. Uh, it's going to be challenging. And my goal, uh, generally right now, obviously there'll be more specific goals, but that is to continue the winning tradition that has been established here with the Dallas Mavericks. In just seven seasons, the Dallas Mavericks had risen from the depths of NBA expansion to division champions. But their playoff hopes were rudely shattered in Seattle. Following that, a coaching change. And all of a sudden, the bright young future of this franchise was cast in doubt. The Dallas franchise had reached its crossroads. 1988, then, would be the Dallas Mavericks year to bounce back. The 1988 Dallas Mavericks were a team ready to shed its NBA adolescence. A talented group, they possessed a varied arsenal of weapons, combining veteran experience and court savvy with hard-driving youthful enthusiasm. The core of the team had been together for several seasons. As the Mavericks started year number eight, they were poised on the threshold of joining the NBA's elite. I looked at it from the standpoint that this is great. It's a good young club that's maturing and getting better. And the future looked very bright for the Dallas Mavericks. On opening night, the future arrived. In the presence of Carl Malone as he powered the Utah Jazz to an early lead. Led by Mark Aguirre's lights out shooting, the Mavericks kept it close. In the third period, the mailman attempted to deliver the knockout blow. But Dallas counterpunched, chipping away at Utah's advantage. And finally took the lead late in the contest. But John McLeod knew any celebration would be premature. And his fears came true when Daryl Griffin's jumper gave the Jazz a one-point lead with five seconds left on the clock. John McLeod can do nothing more than watch. Harper. That's a great feeling for me. Yeah, I think most players in the league, you know, they look forward to the last couple of seconds when you get in that, in that situation where you can win the game or you can make the pass or make the play to win a game. You definitely want to be in that situation. One which Harper has come to thrive in. Misses it. Ball is free on the floor. Harper for three. He got it. Derek Harper has done it again. He provides a lot by leadership. He's hit some big shots for us in some big games. He's always excited out there on the floor when other guys do things well, when he does something well. And that provides us a big lift. I feed off Derek, and I think Derek feeds off me. So all I need is for him to give me a little spark, and he starts to fire. He's always the high firebrand type of uh, individual, and it actually pumps you up a great deal when he comes over there and throws those, those a flurry of punches into your chest or something like that. When I see him, you know, get up and bounce up and punch somebody in the chest, let's go. You know, that's all I need. I'm ready. It's sincere, you know what I mean? I do it. I, I really enjoy the game. I would play this game for free. It just so happens that they're paying, so I want my pay too. But 
if they wasn't paying to play in the league, I would want to be here. I would, I would do it for free. I really enjoy the game of basketball. And I just, I don't hold it inside. I let it all out. In late November, Dallas took a mediocre five and four record into the fabulous forum. During their 87 march to the title, the Lakers won every regular season series with one exception, and the Mavericks planned to continue their success against the Lakers. However, the champions had a plan of their own. Los Angeles built a 27-point third period lead and appeared to be on their way to a typical Showtime blowout. Folding in the forum would have been easy, even expected. Dallas would not. Their pride on the line, the Mavericks battled back, tearing a page from the Laker playbook. They began to beat L.A. at its own game. Laker coach Pat Riley couldn't believe his eyes as the lead dwindled to one. In the end, the comeback fell short. The Lakers were victorious, but the Mavericks were not a defeated team. Prior to the Laker game, uh, we had not been playing well and had been blown out on a couple of occasions and had not looked good at all. I thought it was a big, uh, a big point for us, a big turning point because we came back. We showed some mental toughness. We showed that fight that good teams are made of. We showed character. And the, the following night, we were able to win. So we had a carryover. And from that point on, we had begun to make a move. Dallas would win 14 of its next 18 games, unnerving opponents along the way. Chicago's Air Jordan was grounded. And the good times continued against the hapless Warriors. George Carl started to get that look, as if to say, I've been here before, folks. Next, the Nuggets came to town for a Midwest showdown. But Mark Aguirre was too quick on the draw as he outdueled Doug Moe's top gun. At home, the Mavericks treated the road-weary Kings less than royally. Welcome to Dallas, Coach Russell. On the road, they showed little reverence by trouncing the box in Milwaukee's Mecca. In the Meadowlands, lucky bounces confounded the Nets, while dazzling bounce passes overwhelmed them. On to Chicago, Jordan's domain. But Mark Aguirre staked his own claim to the Windy City, turning the game into a personal homecoming. Dallas was rolling. And now let's go for a visit to the home of Old Man Davis. Yeah, somebody has to show them where the door's at to get into the arena and do different things like that. But uh, they're a good group of uh, rookies. We've gotten uh, to come real close with the brother because he's been really helped us a lot. But we also kid him a lot being, about being 40 years old and being the old man of the team. <laughs> <laughs> well, he gets teased enough, but uh, Brad's been super this year uh, just because he's been a big help to, to myself. He's been a big help to Jim, but uh, you know, he's been around a long time, and I think uh, he knows all the tricks. He knows all the, all the uh, sneaky things to do in this league. You don't get a chance to play that many jokes on the rookies, and uh, you've really got to take advantage of as many practical jokes as you can on them. Well, the one we did with Steve in Indiana was the one that a lot of guys have gone through when they were a rookie. We all got together, and we said, Steve, you know, this is your hometown. I think it's only right that you really lead us onto the court. I didn't want to do it to begin with, but uh, uh, I ended up going out on the floor and uh, just took off out of the tunnel. And uh, I turn, I grab a ball on the floor and turn around, and they're all back in the tunnel, still just laughing their heads off. So it was a lot of fun, and I think that's uh, what I mean by the closeness that we have on this team. Uh, we do have an awful lot of fun, and I'm just a first-year player. And for them to take me in like they have, uh, I think shows a lot of character on their behalf. Dallas began the new year with an old rival, but one with a revamped look and renewed designs on the Mavericks' first place hold. The game had the makings of a typical Houston-Dallas war, with one exception. And here's Harper in the open floor. Nice pass to Blackman, who is blocked by Lovell. Oh, 
look at this. And Roe Blackman is holding at left knee. Boy, that's the scariest sight in sports. Somebody holding his knee like that, and hopefully it's just a bruise. The lose Roe uh, was a blow. However, something good came out of that. It gave Brad Davis uh, a lot of time as a starter, and he uh, proved over and over and over again what kind of a competitor and a player he is. He's a shooter, a defender, a passer. He, he does what needs to be done. What Dallas needed to do was hold on to first place. What they did was extend their lead, due in large part to Davis's inspired play. Brad's been a fantastic player. He's always been the one to step up and do the job each and every time he's been asked. When I was out, he played a fantastic game in the Mavericks, I think, when, when nine and two. People keep counting him out year in, year out. Brad is too old, Brad is too old. Yet every year he comes in and surprises people and, and does a great job. Ellen, what would they have to pay you to do this if you were Brad Davis? Huh? More than I'm making. You're 14 points ahead, and you step in front of a beer truck. He is the old man at the age of uh, 32, but he plays like a young man, believe me. And Brad Davis has a lot of years left. Before joining the Mavericks, John McLeod spent his NBA years in Phoenix as head coach of the Suns. In January, he returned to Memorial Coliseum, but not to his familiar seat. It was strange for me to walk back into the Veterans Coliseum after 14 years of going to the home, to the home bench, and then walking as the visiting coach, walking to the opposition's bench. It was not strange to see the Suns' mascot, but his latest routine did catch the coach's eye. Well, the gorilla. The, the gorilla did a great job. He had his uh, pinstripe suit on with his uh, perm haircut and uh, was calling plays and even had an orange tie on. So he, he did a great job. McLeod and the Suns' moment in the sun came in the 1976 playoffs, battling the heavily favored Celtics in a six-game championship series, which included a very special game number five. Well. That was the greatest game I've ever been involved in. And to be able to see Garfield make that play, it was a tremendous thrill to see the shot go through. Have to throw it up. Gar -her, turn around, shot in the air. Well, the first thing I thought about were, did I have time to get it off, you know? And when I took the shot, if, if I don't know whether it's on the film or not, but I kind of looked over at the official to make sure. And when he threw his hand up in the air, you know, I was just hoping that would go in. <laughs> it was a tremendous thrill. It would have been even been a bigger thrill had we been able to win the darn thing. <laughs> Winning, however, has not eluded John McLeod. On January 13th, he notched victory number 600, but winning was not the only reason he was hired to guide the Mavericks. Professionally, he just, his image is just unbelievable. I mean, he absolutely um, just carries on an image that is, is what I think the league is trying to be all about, and I'm very, very grateful for that. I tell you, there's one thing he does as well as any person I've ever seen in my life, and that's communicate. Uh, he doesn't seem to let things fester or build to the point where there becomes a problem. I can't overemphasize how important the communication thing is. Mark, if you get it right here now, shoot the ball now. Go ahead. That's a good shot. Right dead center now. We want to take that shot now. Yeah, sh shoot that one. Okay. He's a very positive guy, Coach McLeod is. A lot of times it takes that positive approach or come on, Derek, pat you on the butt, let's go. And I think that's what Coach McLeod has brought here. He's really brought a real positive atmosphere. And as a result, he's getting a lot of response out of us. That's it. All right. Good. It is so easy. That's it, Mark and Sam. Keep talking to each other. There's a difference, you know. He, he knows we can kid, and he knows that we can adjust the time to do what we have to do. And uh, that's not something a lot of coaches can take, is a lot of kidding and then, you know, playing ball. But he knows that we know when to cut the kidding off and get down to business, and uh, he installs a lot of his own personal jokes. Sam, you changed the roles with Derek? You saw Derek do that last night, now you got to do it? Huh? There's never a negative word spoken out of his mouth. I think uh, McLeod has just kind of laid it out, made it very clear for everybody, made it very positive and very fun. The fun continued into late January. Riding a four-game win streak, it was party time Texas style. The Mavericks were loose and reaping the rewards of their success. Uh, and today to the Western Conference All-Stars, Number 24, Mark McGuire.
Basking in their fans' adoration, the Mavericks celebrated at the Spurs' expense. McGuire. McGuire gets it back with five seconds to go. Feeds Perkins. Another excellent pass from Mark McGuire. The win streak had reached five. Two nights later, it was the big man's turn in the limelight. And named Wednesday to join Mark McGuire on the Western Conference All-Stars, number 40, James Donaldson. And with the return of their all-star captain, it seemed that things could only get better. Blackman with Shaney on him. Rowe looking to drive, does. Yes. Versus on the layup, and that's got to feel good for Rowe Blackman. That's Mavericks it. go to 28 and 11. It's now the second best record in the entire NBA. Dallas wins his seventh in a row, and at Reunion Arena, But the party came to an abrupt halt as Houston administered a home court humbling. As you can see the frustration building on the Mavericks. Well, it's just the Rockets' night. As Houston dominates Dallas from the start tonight, Bill Fitch's crew had all the answers, and Houston walks away with a 16-point blowout win. Two nights later, the Mavericks' frustration turned into embarrassment. The shockwaves continue to be sent out from Reunion Arena by the New Jersey Nets. This, the most unkind defeat of the year for the Dallas Mavericks, certainly the most painful one. Dallas staring a four-game losing streak in the face going into the All-Star break. On the shores of Lake Michigan, the city of Chicago geared up for the NBA's biggest party. While final all-star preparations were being made, one particular all-star had more important things to attend to. Well, I'm going to get mad. With best friends Isaiah Thomas and Magic Johnson at his side, Mark Aguirre wed his college sweetheart, Angela Bowman. She kind of um, is my stabilizer, actually. She's a very honest person. That's probably one of her biggest, her best points. She's honest and direct and straight to the point. And, uh, that's something that I needed from a person, you know, to be totally honest with me. And sometimes it hurts, sometimes it feels good. And uh, most of all, we're, we're, we're buddies. We're really good buddies. You know, we hang out, do things, you know, wrestle, fight, play ball, whatever. You are now Mr. and Mrs. Mark Aguirre. I now pronounce you husband and wife. And you can take it from here. The following day, the Maverick All-Stars showcased their respective talents. Despite his hectic weekend, Aguirre flashed his patented silky moves and sweet jump shot. As the blue-collar Donaldson enjoyed his well-deserved moment of glory. It felt great. It, it uh, was a very exciting time for me. You know, this could start a whole new trend for all the hard workers in the league, you know, the guys who don't get the gaudy statistics. This could come around to, uh, to reward guys who work hard night in and night out, and the great shop lockers in the league, the great rebounders, the great hard workers and hustlers, maybe they all deserve all-star bursts time to time. As the schedule resumed, the Mavericks looked to break out of their midseason slump. No small task against the Boston Celtics and living legend Larry Bird. With time running out, Dallas believed the game was in hand. Such are the times of which legends are made. 4 3. Yes! yes. Larry Bird for three with four seconds to go. It was time once again to bounce back. The revved up Mavericks left the overmatched Clippers stunned in their way. Dallas was back in the win column. In Seattle, the Mavericks had an old score to settle.
It was back home to Dallas with two road wins notched on their belts. The Bullets came to town and the Mavericks put on a clinic. What a shot Aguirre got off. Look at Mark, even he liked that one. It was three and counting. Once again, the Mavericks were talking tough, flexing their muscles and backing it up. And the Mavericks in a blowout again. Phoenix would be the next victim. The streak had reached five. As the Mavericks try to come off the mat. They've been down all night. Perkins drives and got it. Oh, no. Mavericks by one. Now Perkins with a tough drive down the paint. The Mavericks traveled I-35 south en route to the summit and payback time for an old foe. The Mavericks walk away with their first victory in the last eight tries there at the summit, snapping a three-year drought. The Dallas juggernaut rolled over the Sixers. I think I've read this book before. The win streak reached a club record nine as the Nuggets go to the Mavericks' merciless attack. And the route is officially on at Reunion. Bedlam reigned as everyone got into the act. Rod still screaming for Blob. Here's the long pass. Blob picks it up. Yes, Murray Blob. You gotta love it, don't you? <laughs> you gotta love it. Time once again to visit with Old Man Davis. Uve is uh, a little bit absent-minded. Uh, doesn't always remember things he's supposed to remember, and uh, he hates to get called on it and hates when uh, I make a point that uh, he's wrong and I'm right. You can never get a straight answer out of him. He's always uh, trying to make fun of you, and he's really good at it, too. And, um, you know, it makes the whole thing kind of fun. In a lot of ways, he's like a little 10-year-old. I mean, he's probably double our age, each of us. Every now and then, you've got to slap his hand to keep him in line. While the Mavericks annihilated opponents, a devastating new weapon was being unveiled in Dallas. He is what I call a difference maker. As soon as he comes on the floor, positive things begin to happen. Igniting the team off the bench, Tarpley's physical attributes and relentless desire created havoc for opponents as he ran the floor like a guard and controlled the glass like no other big man in the league. The rebounder in the NBA is the home run hitter or in baseball or the heavyweight champion. He is the commodity or the quality that all good ball clubs have, the dominant rebounder, and that's what Roy Tarpley is. In late February, Tarpley was named NBA Player of the Week, joining the lofty ranks usually reserved for Jordan, Bird, and Magic. The main thing going through my mind is how, how good this made me feel. You know, I had no idea I would accomplish that in the NBA. And then my mom's there, she witnessed it, and that, that makes me feel real even better. It's a great feeling. That's all I can say is it's really great. <laughs> but for Roy Tarpley, the season began on a more somber note. Fortunately for Roy, the Mavericks cared for the person as much as the player. We treated it as if he'd never played basketball for us again. All we cared about is what we could do as friends and as people and as an organization to support and fill into his life. They have given me great support, you know, even when I was down, you know, because a lot of times I just think about what happened and, and the bad publicity that I'm getting. And they will cheer me up by patting me on the back. I said, well, come on, don't even worry about that. As long as we together, that's what's important. We were right there for him. A lot of times in that situation, uh, I think guys on, the, uh, on your team, you know, they kind of kind of get away from you because you don't want to get that rap. But I think we uh, stuck by him, and it made his problem a little bit easier to deal with. Derek Harper, he really called me and, you know, almost cried. He was like, yo, Roy, man, you, you know, you should have called me or something, you know, and, and that, re that really made me feel good. And Mark, he was, he was the same way, and Rolando. Those three guys really gave me a the people I can really lean on, you know, 
tough times came about. He's our friend, the first and foremost, and we really, as a team here, really care about him. They believed in me, and they just hung you know, behind me. They, they stayed with me all the time, and I love, I love them for that. Riding the crest of their 10-game win streak, Dallas was focusing on Houston and oozing confidence. We talked about Mark's nine assists. We talked about Derek's seven steals. We talked about the team total of 37 assists. We're getting excellent distribution of shots, and we're getting four and five guys and double figures every night. And I want to tell you, we're going to get better and better and better. We understood the importance of the game, and you could, you know, you could feel the, the intensity in the locker room. And, uh, I knew when we came out, you know, that guys are going to be real busting their behinds. Go to work, guys. Crashing the boards with reckless abandon, the Mavericks left the Rockets on the launching pad. As always, beating Houston was sweet, but there was little time to savor this victory as a greater challenge loomed on the horizon. How about Sunday? Uh, I'm excited about that. I think the team is too, because you know we won 11 straight, and it's going to be on CBS LA coming to town. Two best team, two best records in the NBA. On a Sunday afternoon in early March, the entire basketball world turned its attention to a packed reunion arena. Inside, a struggle for Western Conference supremacy was about to take place. As the Lakers made their way to the battlefront, the Dallas faithful filled the arena, exuding confidence. They're ready to play. I think the Lakers right now is a little bit nervous trying to hold on to being champions, whereas the Mavericks are saying, let's go out and play ball. But it was the champions who were confident on the court and the Mavericks who looked uncharacteristically tight. We will learn from this. And we will come back. It's going to be important for us to snap back from this. Just learn from our mistakes and just be ready for them next week. Got them next week, and we're hoping to make another adjustment and, uh, and win then. The rematch came down to a battle of wills, and this time Dallas simply wanted it more. Green up and spit him out on that play. Blows the layup. Matthews took no time on the play. There's two. Matthews has it. Tried to dribble behind the back, and the mustard off the hot dog. It was stolen by Harper. Dribble right. Made the last four points. Oh, and nobody's underneath with Aguirre, and he scores easy. He's in the middle. Scotty's still going. Scotty all the way. Put down the three. Checked it beautifully. Injury kept the Magic show off the stage as the Maverick guards dominated the game. But the fire ignited in the West began to fizzle as an East Coast road trip brought a late season letdown. In New York, the Mavericks looked to feast on the Knicks. But Rick Pitino had a different menu in mind. Dallas crumbled under 48 minutes of full court pressure. And 24 hours later, failed to respond to a rare John McLeod ejection in Atlanta. Washington, they were ambushed by a scrappy bullet squad that was desperately scrambling to stay alive in the playoff hunt. In Boston, the sloppy play continued, characterizing the Mavericks' season-ending doldrums, playing sub-500 ball. Dallas let its divisional title slip away. The playoffs were approaching, and the Mavericks were struggling.
Let's take time out and visit with that lovable elder statesman. Oh, my God. No. Bill is good out in the golf course if you've got about six hours to kill. <laughs> what club should I use? Help. Those guys play the mulligan rule. Uh, you know, if they hit one bad, then they drop another one. And if they hit that one better, they'll play that one. And they usually play two or three balls through the green. Notice what I got in my pot. Another orange ball. Little will they know, when I lose that one, just, oops, here I am. By the end, they're trying to add up their strokes, and they can't Two. remember how many strokes they used on one ball, how many strokes they used on the other ball. Three, five. Actually, uh, it's getting better. I brought my score down from 365 to 364, so I'm pretty happy about that. I like to have fun. It's a way to go out and relax and ha -ha. get away out there. And you know, Brad, Steve, Uwe, Detlef, myself, we all get out there every now and then and just hack away. Here we go. Not a bad shot. Golf is very important to me, and it really gets me upset when people fool around on a golf course. Ah, oh, man. That we all knew coming into the season that the Mavericks are going to be judged solely on the playoffs. It doesn't matter if we win 50 games, 60 games, whatever. When the playoffs roll around, that's when everybody's going to be putting the Mavericks under a microscope and seeing exactly how far we go. I know that uh, just from the players that we want to do a lot better than we did last year. I hope we just get really excited about it and go out there and play hard because if we do that, we, we can beat anybody. And it's time to start showing why we wanted the best by going out there um, coming through during the playoffs. For the Mavericks, the new records and the new horizon is how, we, how well we do in the playoffs, because that's what people remember. It was time for an old-fashioned Lone Star feud. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's game, round one of the 1988 NBA playoffs. First in the Hatfields, the McCoys, Texas bragging rights, loser goes home. Rocket hopes rested on the broad shoulders of their all-star center, Akeem Olajuwon, whose ferocious inside play staked them to an early game one lead. Elijah Wan was everywhere, but Dallas stared its tormentor in the eye and didn't blink. The Mavericks countered Akeem's individual brilliance with an inspired team effort. Eight players scored in double figures as they swarmed all over Houston. Rockets were overmatched. Dallas had drawn first blood. Leading one game to none in their best of five series, the players were loose as game two neared. The coaching staff was not. The problem shut down team Akeem, a challenge Roy Tarpley relished. He's one of the best centers in the league, and I like to play against the best players so I can really shine. And, you know, I really get pumped up to play against them. While a pumped-up Tarpley outplayed the league's best center, Roe Blackman sliced up the Rocket defense like a skilled surgeon as Dallas jumped out early. Bill Fitch looked for divine help. His prayers were answered by his slumbering point guard. Sleepy Floyd awoke with a vengeance and took charge of game two, burning the Mavericks for 42 points and performing some backcourt surgery of his own. With the game tied late in the fourth period, Dallas looked to run the Rockets out of Reunion Arena with Tarpley once again leading the charge. Here's Tarpley. Yes. But in the end, Elijah Wan and Floyd were too much. He's taking it. Sleepy Floyd. 
The Rockets had achieved their split in Dallas and could wrap up the series at home. For the Mavericks, it was soul-searching time, but more importantly, they had to put this devastating loss behind them. And for Rolando Blackman, that meant going home. It's just a fantastic release for me just to forget about the game and move on to the next day. Especially after a loss or something like that, I completely forget about that and move on at home because there are, there are real life things happening there at home. Family is very important to me. My girls, Valerie and Brittany are the most important things. My wife, Tamara, um, all the things that I never had. We came from a broken home, so it's uh, just very, very important that we all stick together, stay together. Let it kiss. Let it kiss, girls. Come here. Mm -hmm. Tamara is the same way too. She knows that I play basketball and all those great things. But uh, but when I come home, I'm just you know, Rolando, take out the garbage today, those type of things. So it's uh, it's really the real perspective of life. As the series shifted to Houston for Game Three, the local papers had already printed the Mavericks playoff obituary. If you were a Houston newspaper reader, you picked up the Chronicle today, you saw a Franz column that said the Mavericks were a bunch of flea-bitten dogs, gutless pigs that were about to be roasted on the spit of the Houston Rockets. Fran, come on, you don't have to be modest. Tell us how you really feel about the Mavericks. Well, it just looks to me like they're right in the regular playoff form. They uh, roll over and play dead this time every year. But the Mavericks were far from dead. Proving the so-called experts wrong, they refused to roll over and came out instead like a pack of hungry dogs. Playing both ends of the floor with renewed intensity, the Mavericks turned stellar defensive performances into offensive works of art. By halftime, the Summit crowd had been silenced, but it was not to last. As the Rockets caught fire, stepping up their game and mounting a furious comeback. Fourth quarter was played in the trenches, a defensive struggle that saw lead change after lead change as Tarpley and Olajuwon matched bucket for bucket. But it was Akeem who had the last shot at victory. To McCray. To Akeem. No. No. Maverick wins. Olajuwon got the open jump shot. For those who felt the Mavericks had one foot in the grave, this was a rude awakening. The Dallas Mavericks were alive and kicking. There have been a lot of things written about uh, our club and the fact that we can't win and that we're all these different things that we've been accused of being, but we're making some progress here and we're, we're getting better as a team and uh, I think we'll continue to get better. But things quickly turned for the worse as Houston looked to even the score in game four. Frustrated and embarrassed at scoring only 14 first period points, the Mavericks had dug themselves into a rather sizable hole as they found themselves a step behind the revved up Rockets. But Dallas battled back, clawing its way to higher ground as Sam Perkins scored the final four points of the half. Perkins' heroic set the table for one of the most potent scoring machines in the NBA. And Mark Aguirre's 27 point third quarter feet finished the Rockets. And here's Aguirre. Pulls up, shoots for three, got it! And there's a new team record for the Mavericks for points in a period, Mark Aguirre. And this one is over. The Dallas Mavericks have advanced to the second round of the Western Conference playoffs as they sweep the Rockets here at Maverick owner Donald Carter put this series in perspective. Our players and our coaches, our whole staff, uh, myself included, we needed to prove to ourselves that we could come through in the clinch with the character, and I think they did. No one gave us this. We really we went out and, and took this away from them. So I think, like I said, we gained confidence from here, and we go from here. 
It was on to round two in Denver, Colorado, where the Nuggets held the all-important home court advantage. By losing game two, Denver let that home court advantage slip through their grasp, but quickly snatched it back when Bill Hanslick's finger roll in game three beat the clock and the Mavericks. In game four, the running attack came to life as the Nuggets were buried under an avalanche of fast break layups. The teams would go back to Denver, not at it too. It was still anybody's series. The Mavericks decided it would be theirs. Doug Moe felt the pain of the seemingly unstoppable Maverick attack. So Mark Aguirre put an end to Moe's suffering. Davis kicks it off to Aguirre for three. Got it! Mark Aguirre with a three-pointer that may have broken the back of the Nuggets. Before game six could get underway, there was important business to attend to. The 1988 Miller Lite NBA Six Man Award to the Mavericks, Roy Tarpley. Mark McGuire's early foul trouble put a damper on the festivity. Someone would have to fill the scoring void. Sam Perkins did just that. Denver into costly turnovers, making them pay dearly at the other end. Reunion rocked in anticipation of Denver's demise. It was time to nail the Nugget coffin shut. Shrimp flies home. Exclamation point. Another hoop here puts Denver in a terrible fix. Blackman gets to the basket. Uh, let's have Sam Perkins step in, uh, as he did most of the first half tonight, step in. Sam, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine right now. It's, uh, I got a little tingle to me, but uh, I feel fine. For soft-spoken Sam Perkins, avoiding the glare of the media comes naturally, and while widespread acclaim eludes him, his contributions do not go unnoticed. I, mean, I love playing with Sam Perkins. He is just... Easy going, laid back, easy to get along with. Yeah, he's got these arms and then just flick over there, you know, and help out. We call him that one nervous Sam, and you know, he's the quiet assassin. He he does the job quietly. <laughs> Denver and Houston felt the sting of the silent assassin's lethal touch. For the lanky role player extraordinaire, it was just business as usual, doing what needed to be done. Sam is our silent assassin. You watch the game film, and Sam does the little things that count so very much in a team win. We know that we're a very good basketball team when Sam's out there because he's just our all-around uh, do-everything guy, and um, we, we need him a lot. For many would-be vacationers, the trip to L.A. conjures up images of carefree beachside leisure. But not all visitors to this resort paradise have fun and sun on their minds. As the Mavericks prepared to face their toughest test yet, the media focused its attention on the emerging challengers and their bold aspirations. I think it's time for the Lakers and the Celtics to step aside and for Dallas and some team in the East to be in the NBA championship. It's time for new blood. It's time for new excitement. 
and for new people to be uh, be there, and it may as well be us. Experience. Intensity. Pride. Tradition. Often overlooked amidst the dazzle of showtime is the Lakers' unquenchable thirst for victory. Years of playoff wars have hardened L.A.'s resolve. The Lakers would send an unmistakable message to its upstart rival, and as they rolled over the stunned Mavericks in games one and two, Dallas could only stand by and watch in confusion. The champions had served notice that they would not yield easily. Wanting the throne was one thing, taking it was another. Were the Mavericks up to the task? The outlook was bleak. As they headed for friendlier confines, the Mavericks were left wondering if they had what it took to halt the Laker blitz. The scene shifted to the Mavericks' home turf, a lion's den for the Lakers. 17,000 delirious fans with just one thought on their minds. Above the playing floor, the Lone Star flag symbolized epic battles fought in the state of Texas. Below, another was about to take place. No one was spared from the physical carnage. But when James Donaldson received a blow to the face, a gentle giant released his fury. Once you kind of see the sight of your own blood or taste your own blood, uh, that gets you going more than anything. And so uh, there was no reason for me to let up. With the taste of his own blood filling his mouth, Donaldson became a seven foot, two inch, 280 pound tower of terror. Controlling both ends of the floor, Donaldson shut down the skyhook, and Dallas gave L.A. a dose of its own medicine. With their captain neutralized, the Lakers called out the reserves, who fared no better. The Mavericks then turned game three into a half-court game, one which they would dominate. Like all great teams, Dallas was loaded with talented competitors, ready to step forward and take charge. In game four, Derry Harper took that step. Harper's 35-point explosion enabled Dallas to maintain a slim lead throughout the contest. And when John McLeod called Rolando Blackman's number, the Mavericks captain responded and sealed the win. Two convincing victories at home gave the Mavericks new life. The Lakers would not have a cakewalk into the finals. They were in a dogfight with a team and a city obsessed with that one notion. But the Mavericks wilted again on the West Coast, and now L.A. eyed the clincher. Our guys have been there, and I think they sense the fact that we're one game away now, just one win away from getting to the finals to try to achieve this goal of ours, and I think you're going to see an inspired performance. It's going to take a lot by Dallas to beat us. But John McLeod had other ideas as he regrouped his troops for one last stand. We know that if they trap us, we'll be able to handle their trap. But then if they come out man to man and get real aggressive, all we have to do is what? Just keep moving the basketball and move yourself and keep hunting the open man down with the pass. All right? Dallas was fighting for their playoff lives as they faced elimination for the first time in 1988. And Magic Johnson was eager to send the Mavericks home for the summer. Neither team could muster a substantial run as momentum shifted early and often. Free 
chief offensive flurries were quickly countered. Emotions reached a feverish pitch. But John McLeod coolly rallied his team. Dallas put together a fourth quarter run led by Mark Aguirre, who displayed his varied offensive repertoire. With Derek Harper's layup, it was time for the Lakers to regroup. In true championship fashion, the Lakers chipped away at the Dallas lead. The inevitable L.A. run, absent in games three and four, finally came. Game six was going down to the wire. The Lakers call this winning time. For the Mavericks, it was time to grow up. Cooper will have the ball out of bounds. He'll throw it in. They move it to Worthy. Worthy on the crash. One more plane trip to L.A. A confident Maverick team. Seemingly loose and relaxed on the outside. But inside, their minds on the matter at hand. It's for the money now, they say. You know, you, you lose now, then you, you start your summer vacation. So I'm thinking about preparing for them tomorrow night because I know that's where their mind is. Game day. An ominous sunrise of purple and gold filled the morning sky. The Mavericks had advanced to the seventh game of the Western Conference Finals. To play beyond this day, they would have to shut down the vaunted Laker running attack. Offensively, the Dallas game plan was simple. The final mental preparations had begun. The Mavericks were about to play the biggest game of their lives. We're out here in a franchise's history, our own history. A lot of people don't uh, ever get to this, this chance, and uh, we're going to go for it and make the best of it. Next possession, the Mavericks threw it into overdrive. John McLeod's crew had weathered the early storm and now stood toe to toe with LA, slugging it out for the remainder of the second period. With 
the clock running down, Pat Riley wanted a lead to take into the locker room. Kareem obliged. But trailing by just one at the half, Dallas was primed for the upset. As the third quarter began, Dallas turned steals by Sam Perkins and Roy Tarpley into a pair of Mark Aguirre layups and opened up a small lead. It would be their final lead of the season. As Magic Johnson quickly extinguished the Maverick spark by single-handedly recapturing control of the game. labored against a 10-point deficit for much of the fourth period and saw their last glimmer of hope fade with Byron Scott's three-point dream crusher. The Lakers would advance and play for the championship. For the Mavericks, the season had ended. But not before they had earned the respect of their peers and silenced their critics. Stretching the defending world champions to the limit, the Mavericks had proven their mettle. They had come of age. Our guys are thinking like winners, and that is the first step. We want to be on top just like the Lakers. We will have to continue to mature, but there's no reason why, why we can't and why we won't. We should get better and better. Next year is next year. I mean, it's a, it's a situation you put all your guns, you get loaded all up again. Uh, we hope to put the effort again together next year and then come back out here. So I think we've learned a lot. I really do. I think we have to, uh, as a team, think about what it was like going through all of this and just come back and try and better ourselves next year. I, I, I think uh, where we've come from, you know, has really given us a lot of confidence as a team. Get better. 